I'm Tim Clark, and this is Conversations About the Vietnam War. My guest today is Dave Wagner. Uh, Dave was a part of the headquarters company of the 2nd Brigade of the 25th Infantry Division. And uh, Dave, I believe uh, you came from a local high school around here, and when did you graduate? Graduated in 1962 from Issaquah High School in Issaquah, Washington, and then went on to uh, higher education with Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. Originally uh, wanted to become a teacher and thought I would be very interested in that, but as everything happens, uh, that major changed and I ended up in 1967 uh, getting a degree in sociology and religion and had a free ride to um, a divinity school, uh, University of Chicago, uh, actually called uh, Lutheran School of Theology at the University of Chicago. So you're actually looking at becoming a Lutheran minister. I was looking at becoming a Lutheran minister. Uh, but you say that uh, your mindset kind of changed before you went running off in that direction. So it, what was going on? It did change because uh, I, um, I was just burned out. Been in school for a lot of years, and uh, I just couldn't do school anymore. And uh, unfortunately, my mother was uh, kind of upset about that, but... Um, when you dropped out of school in 1967, uh, something happened very quickly, and in September of 67, since I didn't go back to school, I got a draft notice. All right, so what are your options, and what did you end up doing? My options were <laughs> that I was going to report for uh, draft at uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, or actually Seattle, and I ended up... Uh, taking that letter unopened and went to the Air Force and said, uh, you got any room for a guy like me? I said, sorry, they were full. Um, didn't have any room because a lot of people were getting in the Air Force and the Navy instead of having to be drafted and go in the Army. And so then I went to the Navy and they were full. And so I went to the Army and said, what can you do for me? And as a college grad, they said, we can give you 120 day delayed enlistment and uh, you'll report to Fort Dix, New Jersey in January of 1968. Um, so I swore into the Army on, I think it was October 27th, 1967, and reported for duty January 28th, 1968. All right, so Fort Dix is in New Jersey. Fort Dix is in New Jersey. You're going to go through basic there. Basic and AIT, Advanced Infantry Training. And uh, then after I got out of advanced infantry training in, at the end of May of 1968, I uh, had two weeks leave and then went to Fort Benny, Georgia, where I uh, went to officer's candidate school. And the also in infantry training. Infantry training. Infantry officer uh, at training for becoming an officer or OCS, officer candidate school. Okay, but they're not going around. Not everybody graduates. No. Uh, my class started with uh, over 200. I think it was 225. And uh, uh, those who graduated in November of uh, 1968 were probably about 177. I think it was 177 that graduated. And probably out of that 177, uh, a good 150 went to Vietnam about the same time um, as I did. And that's because of the rotation policies of that period right. of time. A lot of, uh, lot of young second lieutenants going over to become platoon leaders and take over uh, different assignments. Um, the casualty rate for uh, second lieutenant infantry lieutenants, uh, that is those who would get into country and go lead a uh, platoon about 23 days and they would be wounded or killed and uh, so that was a major turn turnaround at that time. Okay so before you actually get to Vietnam you ended up going to Fort Jackson South Carolina? Fort Jackson South Carolina as a, what they called a basic training um, 
Oh gosh, I can't even think, I can't remember the term, but just give me a second. I was a basic training officer, BCT, for a basic training company at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So you're actually running people through basic training. Basic training, that's okay. correct. All right, but you now have, in fact, been oriented towards what it means to lead a unit in combat, correct. and you get your notice, you're going to Vietnam. Going to Vietnam, and uh, I left uh, to go to jungle school in Panama for three weeks prior to going to Vietnam, and that was in uh, May time frame of 1969. All right, you uh, eventually are uh, put on uh, military aircraft, uh and civilian aircraft, so they charter aircraft. flight, went to uh, went down to um, Panama for jungle training, um, then got on an aircraft, flew back to the States, was told to be at Travis Air Force Base on a certain day, and then we got on a charter flight and uh, flew what seemed like forever to Vietnam. And landed and was orientated for about a week at the 25th Division, and then went to the field. All right, so uh, uh, division headquarters was Kuchi. Kuchi. And then uh, you ended up going to be assigned to what fire base? I went to fire base Patton. I was with uh, B Company, 2nd Battalion, 14th Infantry. Uh, just to tell you what that is, that's an infantry company that's assigned to an infantry regiment. Um, and uh, the battalion was a 2nd Battalion. So B Company, 2nd Battalion, 14th Infantry Regiment, 25th Division. All right, now a fire base as such is a support for people in the field. What Correct. actually Correct. comes from the fire base? Uh, they, they're they actually uh, uh, probably two different uh, companies. Um, so it was our company, and I can't remember what the other company was, so B Company and maybe A Company. So you have at least two companies of infantry, and then you'll have uh, indirect fire from a battery or a part of a battery of artillery, and then you'll have your own uh, mortars and uh, all the logistics that go along with that. And logistics, simply a term to uh, talk about supply, resupply, everything that takes care of uh, personal needs of the human being in a military setting. Okay, but in the fire base specifically, you're going to have large guns that will basically be directed from people in the field for your support. That's correct. Now, that's and not only that, but you, you'll have also air support and support from other fire bases within the area. So you're not just supported by that fire base alone. So you spend some time at uh, Patton, and then you basically, when do you actually get uh, command of your platoon? Uh, I actually was there with within that platoon within the first week after arriving in Vietnam. Okay, so, and, and then that platoon uh, ends up going out, uh, basically uh, 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 fire support base. Hunsley? Fire support base Hunsley in the, and the geographic area that we were assigned to operate in was a place called uh, the Hobo Woods. And if you think of the Hobo Woods, uh, sounds like just a wooded area. Hobo Woods were, was a very large area, uh, about like Bellevue is to Seattle, a huge geographical area. And so our, my platoon, along with my company, was not only... Uh, the only company to work the Hobo Woods. There were several units working in the Hobo Woods. So there are fire bases all around all it. All around. And maybe fire bases not only from the 25th Division, but the Big Red One, which was in the area. And we get uh, a lot of air support, air support from our helicopter people out of our division and forward air support from the Air Force and or Navy that we could call in at a moment's notice to help help us with. All right. Now, in building a fire base, uh, if I were, if there was nothing there, what's the first thing that's going to become the designated area? First thing that's going to happen is you're going to put your infantry unit in a security position around the area that you're going to make, and then probably a Chinook, which is the twin blade helicopter, 
will bring in uh, some engineer units with bulldozers and they'll scrape away the soil and push it up into a berm so it looks like a uh, vacant field with a lot of dirt around that. So um, that berm becomes part of your security. Then the next thing that happens is you build bunkers around that berm to live in and fight from. And uh, that, that berm becomes your security. Okay. Along with wire outside the berm. Now, uh, obviously at a fire base uh, support area, you're basically going to get sent out on missions, right? Correct. And, Lots of missions. And some of those are true reconnaissance and force. Correct. So describe that for me. Let's say uh, you, you've got an intelligence report and there is uh, uh, military activity of the enemy located at such and such a, a intersection. A village. They could be in a village. The, that maybe at night that they saw through starlight scopes that they saw infantry or military or Viet Cong going into this village. So <clears throat> they, we, they'd send us out to have a look at that village. So a reconnaissance in force, nicknamed RIF, you would physically be in a platoon lead. So my platoon would lead, and that would be about 15 people, not, not many more than that. A typical infantry platoon would have 40 people, but in this case, uh, in Vietnam, we didn't have that many people. So we were looking at about 15 people that would go to the field in my platoon. Then the company uh, element would be right in the middle, and that would be the company commander, and radios, and uh, probably a forward air controller from the Air Force, which we had, he was a first lieutenant. And then a second platoon would follow in support. So we went to the field uh, about 40 strong, 35 to 40 strong, that's all we had. But we had our own weapons, which in my case, I carried an M16. I also carried a 45 caliber pistol. Um, I carried all the ammunition for that. And um, because I was ordnance trained, explosive trained, I carried all the uh, explosives along with some of my soldiers to uh, blow up bunkers, uh, destroy things that uh, were, were yes. a problem for us. Okay. Uh, now, unfortunately, you're in a combat area that's fairly alive and you have a large number of these insertions in just six months. Correct. About how many? Uh, I did over a hundred airborne insult, uh, insertions and what, what that would mean is that uh, aircraft would fly in next to the fire base or fire support base. We would load on the aircraft, lift off, and go to another area and insert. And uh, we did that in that six month period of time. I, I know I got two air medals, uh, one air medal with two Oakley clusters, which means we, we were well over 100 insertions. So a lot of uh, air insertions. Plus a riff would be, we would leave the fire base or fire support base and then walk out. Uh, people call it a march. It's not, it's a hike. We'd hike out into the woods and uh, we'd have our maps to orientate us as well as then any support that we would need for that. All right, so let's get to know your platoon a little bit. Uh, the bad news is uh, they came from a very bad experience. Can That's you correct. kind of give us a snapshot of what had happened before uh, you got just, there? Just before I was assigned to the platoon, um, the platoon was uh, under a different uh, lieutenant and that lieutenant allowed an ambush patrol to leave uh, camp that uh, the one evening. And he let the leader of that, and I'm not sure that was a platoon sergeant or just the lead element, he allowed them to go outside the berm of the camp and then lay on the outside of the berm instead of going to their destination to do their night ambush patrol. Um, he let them lay on the outside. And the unfortunate thing that happened is the we, the company, received incoming fire that night from mortars. 
It didn't hit inside the camp. It didn't hit inside the berm, but it scared the fellows who were laying outside that were supposed to be on ambush patrol. They jumped up and started to run over the berm inside. And uh, not everybody knew that they were laying out there. So people saw them running inside and actually fired on them because they thought that they were enemy soldiers that were coming in and over the wire. Wire on the outside, berm, they thought we were being uh, invaded by enemy soldiers. And then they uh, fired uh, several war wounded and it, to the best of my memory, because I inherited this situation, uh, two were killed. And so that platoon leader was relieved and court-martialed and so was the platoon sergeant court-martialed. And uh, then they were sent home and I, sent, I think subsequently got um, not so good discharges. All right, so you had casualties, wounded and dead, and these people clearly have had a, a break in trust in terms of leadership big, and where you time, go. Big time, and then I had, to, I had to take that over and I can tell you that the, uh, it, I knew it right away that there was a, a trust issue with uh, leadership. They just didn't trust leadership because they were. Uh, well, that's a pretty traumatic incident. It was, and it's tough to explain what friendly fire is to people back home. Yeah, and, and, and I'm sure that the parents of those soldiers always wondered what happened to my son, you know, why, why was he killed? And it, it was. It wasn't a good thing, but so I had to take that platoon and rebuild the morale and and uh, make them be able to trust us again. And that was a that was a tough, tough, tough thing. And uh, and you also have the problem of integrating replacements. Correct. You get a new medic at that time. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, as I remember right, Doc Diwali came in at just about that time. I can't remember if he was in the platoon before, but. Because he was my medic for the platoon, he and I became really close. And uh, um, uh, we, we uh, actually bunked together because uh, he was part of the command element so, supposed, supporting uh, uh, my platoon. And just to let you know, we, we had code names and my code name was 1-6. First platoon, six is always the number that you use for the command of that. So um, B company, uh, he would be B6. And uh, I was 1-6. So I was in the first platoon. So the second platoon leader would be 2-6. So we always had code names. All right. So uh, let's just kind of talk about uh, what a typical insertion in, in a, uh, was going to go like. So uh, you have been brief. You're going to be working with other elements. You've looked at the maps. You know where the LZ is. What's it like coming in on, on a helicopter? Uh, scary because usually in the briefing the night before, before you go out on the, um, you're told it's probably going to be a hot LZ. And an LZ is means landing zone. So if it's going to be a hot LZ, that LZ is probably prepped with artillery fire. And like I told you, sometimes that artillery fire goes over the top of the helicopters that are carrying you and it's landing and you can look out and watch it land and you know that's where you're going in. Not, not all the time did it fire over the helicopters, but m more than likely that LZ was prepped before you landed. All right, so how high are you? 1,000 to 3,000 feet. Okay, and so the rounds coming in are really coming oh, in. Oh, yeah, you can hear them. And you, you can also, sometimes you can hear them hit the helicopter, and that's, that's a scary thing, too. Uh, we were lucky in our platoon because we never had anybody injured inside the helicopter in the six months I was in the field. Uh, but we took a few rounds. So you're, uh, you're very um, nervous, scared. It's supposed to be a hot LZ, you land, you deploy from the helicopters, the helicopters lift off right away. They don't stay there with you, they lift off. So you, you basically, they flare in, you jump out, hit the ground, they take off right away. 
and they're gone. Um, so then you form up and you make sure the area is secure. And if it is and you didn't take any fire, then you can begin your reconnaissance in force to wherever it is you're going. And I always carried my map right here on my left side. And uh, um, I, was, I was pretty good with a map. I was, in fact, I pride myself that I can read a map today pretty good. Don't get lost too often. Hey, Didn't get lost in Vietnam. Okay, but you're still going into areas that you haven't been before, Correct. and some of those areas are occupied. Correct. And uh, let's, let's talk about the uh, uh, DeWall and the incident. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, that was shortly before I came out of the field, and uh, we had uh, one area that we were working in the Hobo Woods that we believed was a battalion headquarters. And we'd been going around it for a long time, several weeks, but the more we knew that we'd have to get in, so we called penetration inside. And we started in, uh, I will tell you that we, uh, my platoon was the lead platoon, and behind my platoon was a platoon of Arvin, Army uh, of Vietnam. Uh, so, so we called it South Vietnamese Army, um, not Viet Cong, but South Vietnamese Army friendly. So my platoon was leading, and then right behind my platoon was a platoon of Arvin. And we're tr uh, trying to go into this one area, and the first thing I hear is boom, and I hear guys screaming because they just hit a booby trap. And uh, so then within... 10 seconds, boom, another booby trap and another guy screaming. So I said to my medic, Doc, you're going to have to get in there and uh, get those guys, fix them up. We'll wait here. Let me know what the situation is. So he went forward and within just a few seconds, I heard a boom and I heard him yell that he was hurt. So I had my platoon uh, form um, kind of protection for me. And then I threw my weapon over my shoulder and I went in and started carrying soldiers out. Band, bandaged them up and then uh, get them out. Already had uh, uh, dust off, that's a helicopter with medical support. Already had them uh, called, uh, command element called them. And so I knew they were coming in and smoke was popped for them to come in. And it's a purple smoke or a yellow smoke or whatever, so they know where to come and land. Got those guys out, medics were taking care of them, they got them in the helicopter, and then I went in and got Doc, and I carried him out. And I didn't really get an extensive look at his wounds, but I knew he was scared, and uh, I picked him up over my shoulder and ran him back and put him on the helicopter, and he looked down at me and waved, and about that time the helicopter took off and left. And that was the last time I saw him, and uh, that's the way it, that's the way it was in Vietnam. Uh, there were times when you you waved goodbye and you never saw him again. So the reality is, you're sharing a bunk with people. You get to know them in their personal lives, like any other like any other war, uh, and they become a casualty the next day, and and then you never see them again or hear about how they did and. Your, your hope is that everything came out okay, and that happened a lot. I, in my six months in the field, I had uh, two soldiers killed, and that that's always a heartbreak. That's always that's just rips your heart out, and uh, same thing. Um, they we were in an area, and and uh, they both tripped uh, trip wires from a booby trap, and uh, I'll I'll tell you about that sign that we talked about before, but um, one was hurt real bad and uh, the other one I, f I, I couldn't detect a pulse. So I had my guys uh, perform, uh, make a security perimeter and I ran in there and uh, picked them both up and carried them out to the command element where the helicopter was already called. And so I lost one and I found out later that the other one died so um, that always hurts that your soldiers working for you didn't make it and uh, 
you asked me before about Tudia. Tudia was a sign that would be on a, like a stake driven in the ground and it would have a skull and crossbones and it would have T-U and then uh, a dash D-I-A. That means you're gonna, that, that area's mind, it would tell all the Vietnamese that lived in that area that that area was mined. And uh, uh, in today's world, we talk about um, IEDs, improvised explosive devices. And in Vietnam, we call them booby traps, but the same principle. They're, uh, they're explosive devices that are set to kill you. And um, the sign that was put on there was Tudia, a Tudia sign. So you, you definitely did not want to go into that area, but we had to. Uh, to find the enemy, we had to go in. And that right. meant people died. Okay, so uh, in a normal reconnaissance in, in force with the n number of missions you've got, you know you're going to have uh, a, a combat uh, encounters in that, but you Absolutely. also have people that are supposed to be able to come in and help you, particularly if you uh, find yourself confronted by a larger force. So sure. What kind of help are you going to get? So you, would, uh, you could have a, let's, let's say that you had uh, that mission in that area that we talked about where the battalion headquarters. On the far side, I don't remember what was north, east, west, I had a, there was another company uh, of our battalion that was securing that area and then we were on this other side and uh, stopped to take a lunch break, eat some sea rations, made security and while we were doing that I was uh, trying to comfort myself a little bit, use the bathroom and uh, when I looked up there was an NVA soldier from here about a hundred feet away. NVA soldier. And the NVA is a North Vietnamese regular army soldier. As I, I knew to. it was because of the way he was dressed. And uh, so I'm, think, I'm thinking he's alone and he's probably thinking I'm alone. So I reached for my M16 and started to head back at the same time then I saw him pull out a pistol and he was going to shoot at me. So we both turned and started to fire. And when we did, my guys uh, came up and they saw him running and they started to fire as well. So we knew that there was probably a North Vietnamese contingent in that wooded area, maybe a battalion headquarters. Got a little hairy because as we fired into that, the company on the other side fired into that so there were bullets whizzing through. And if you've never had a bullet whiz by your head, it's weird because you can hear it go. I mean, it's and it's, it's the weirdest sound you've ever heard. And you just wonder, hit the ground and still hear it coming close. You got to fire back. And uh, so I formed the security. So we fired for a while and then um, cease fire to see if there was anything. We did a little bit of uh, reconnaissance to see if we hit anything, but we couldn't find anything. And uh, shortly thereafter, helicopters came in because it was starting to get dark and we needed to get back to base. So uh, important fact was we knew that, that was, there had to be a headquarters in that wooded area. And we went back there several days, several days. And that time we went back is when Doc got hit. And that, that hurt. And I've always, I, I think I told you this already, I've always wondered what happened to him. I've always wondered. Um, I, I hope you got home okay. So. All right. Uh, so, so if we, uh, l let's talk about uh, uh, your, that wooded area is also near the Saigon River, is that correct? correct. And uh, did you ever deal with? A Actually, Hobo Woods was not very far away from the Saigon River, and we did. We went to the river on Helleborn Mission several times, and one time we went down to work with the swift boats. So and what's a swift boat? Swift boat is a, a looks, it's a very fast moving boat, and it looks like a very powerful boat. They have uh, some armament on the boat, like a 
250 caliber machine guns mounted and an M60 machine gun mounted. And then uh, we took a small contingent of my platoon and we worked on the boat for two days. So we went up and down the river and my guys would go into villages just to explore and then report back what they, what they saw to see if do you think enemy is using this village. And in most all cases, we did, but we couldn't prove it. But we, we did believe that they were using the villages. And they would be intimidating to the people that lived in those villages. Um, I'm sure the villagers feared them as much as they feared us. Uh, how would you like to live in an environment like that where no matter who was on the ground, you, you were in fear? So, um, so we did work the river. Uh, the thing that I remember, the scariest thing I remember working the river is one time the helicopter hovered over what we thought was grass growing alongside the river. And we actually jumped down into that and the grass just sank into the river. And so here you are fully armed, fully loaded with everything. And now you're going in almost over your head and you basically had to swim, crawl to get to the shore. If they would have been there and shot at us, we'd have been completely, uh, we wouldn't have had any defense. We couldn't have fired back. So that, that was terribly scary. Uh, and finally we got up on the riverbank and we were able to form up and then uh, do our reconnaissance in force. And then the helicopters picked us up in a drier area. Um, it was very wet, very hot. For people who don't know what Vietnam is like, it's like the southeast of the United States. It's about 80, 90, 100 degrees every day and probably 90% humidity. So you're constantly sweating and perspiring. I carried a towel around my neck along with all my weapons and um, my, uh, my, I carried a lot of uh, explosives, as I said, and I also carried a lot of grenades. I was like a big human walking bomb is what it was like. But I didn't think of it that way. I felt like it was great personal protection. All right, so you find yourself going back into Hobo Woods. You've located what clearly is a tunnel complex. Correct. What, uh, what happens now? Uh, you got to go in and check out those tunnels. And when you go down into that, I, each platoon has what we call a tunnel rat because they're small and agile and they can get in and they can look around and you gotta believe that that's scary because they go down with a flashlight and a weapon and if they encounter anybody in there, they're by themselves. So this tunnel rat will go down into the hole and uh, probably get into a large cavern, which is a complex of uh, tunnels and then he would search and then I would go down in with him to see what was in there. Could we capture anything? Are there any soldiers? But the, some of those tunnel complexes were so, uh, uh, you knew that there was further tunnels that went off of those rooms. So the tunnel would go down into a big cavernish room and you knew that there were other tunnels in there. So you definitely want to destroy it. So you would, Mark it or bring in demolition and destroy it as you could. All right, for the uninformed, how far underground are you? Why don't these things simply collapse after people walk over? Because it's the dry season in Vietnam. In the dry season, the ground is like hard, like cement. It's been so hot and so dry, that ground just dries up and it becomes uh, like a hard, like cement because it's kind of a clay soil. And, um, so it would form huge rooms and huge tunnels. And maybe the water would never ever get down there, or maybe it would, and they would be able to drain it away. But that was their security. Just like the berms around our, their security were the tunnels and the tunnel complexes. And uh, they lived underground. And there was tons of them everywhere. Okay, but the one you're in, you're going to take out of circulation. Correct. How do you do that? Well, I called in for a lot of explosives, so we took some shape charges. Shape charges are uh, like a large bomb, but it's shaped so that it, the explosion blows downward. 
So you set the shape charges on the soil above the tunnel complex, and then below you put Bangalore torpedoes or what C4, whatever you need to create a big explosion. So you're hoping that those are timed together to go off, and then once you set the fuse, you need to get out of the area because it's gonna it's gonna go boom in a big way, and we uh, we destroyed a lot of tunnels that way, a lot of them. So I, not only was I a tunnel rat, but I was also my own uh, explosive guy, so that I knew how to set the fuses and direct the fire so it would it would blow up. Many times we called in airstrikes because we would mark it with uh, smoke. We would go back and let the uh, Air Force or Navy come in with big 500 pound bombs and blow up that area. And then we'd go back in later and see if there was anything exposed. So in this particular case, this day, uh, we found it, um, I caused a huge explosion. <laughs> You know, uh, dirt everywhere, um, and some say there was secondary explosions, which means there was probably their armaments that went off as well. But uh, when we got back in there to search, we couldn't find one body. And that's another thing that a lot of people uh, in those days, the way to... Uh, Win a war was all conditional on body count. We thought that uh, if you could count bodies after uh, a firefight or an explosion or whatever, that would win. We, we I think that was uh, not the right way to go. And obviously history has proved that. We didn't take territory. We didn't own the ground afterwards like we'd done in other wars. Uh, we went on belief that if we found bodies, that that would make the enemy want to quit fighting, but it didn't happen. All right, so after you've been at this hardcore combat operation, you now have a sense of the operation, and you got uh, promoted and reassigned? Promoted to first lieutenant. One year after I graduated from um, OCS at Fort Benning, Georgia, that one year as a second lieutenant was up and I got promoted to a first lieutenant and usually they pulled the first lieutenants out of the field and you went back to base camp. And I guess I was really lucky because a lot of my classmates from OCS uh, got wounded and were evacuated to the United States. And uh, um, so I was pretty lucky. I was wounded twice, uh, minor injuries, mostly from shrapnel from booby traps um, and once from, <laughs> once from a, um, ammunition box at base camp and the helicopter went over and blew the ammunition boxes over and they fell on my foot and uh, didn't break it, but boy, it was bruised. So, uh, so I was hurt there and then I was wounded twice by shrapnel. Um, but I was lucky. All right. What? What? Uh, uh, so, uh, first of all, where do you get assigned? Uh, headquarters and headquarters company, Second Brigade headquarters, Kuchi, Vietnam. Okay. And that's a fairly large base. Large base. And uh, but you found yourself a little dissatisfied with leadership. Uh, very much so because um, you're actually assigned to a unit that has a lot of soldiers. And those soldiers are uh, working for the sections of the brigade headquarters. They're not working for the company. When you're in the company, like I was as a soldier, you got a lot of men and they're assigned and they work with you day to day to day to day. In this case, even though we got a lot of soldiers assigned, they're working for Devardi or they're working division artillery, uh, division aviation, whatever, they go to work and work for them. So they don't work for the company commander. So it's basically you're providing the logistics for those people like food and quarters and all the stuff that would 
take care of their human comfort and nobody to work for you. So it becomes very frustrating, extremely frustrating. All right, let me, let me just throw in an example and, and correct me if I'm wrong. So if you're dealing uh, out of headquarters, but the division, the larger unit, is basically got people at your base and their job is to basically be aware of just artillery. Mm -hmm. So they're going to deal with how many uh, 155 millimeter uh, uh, guns have we got? Self-propelled, yeah, mm -hmm. right. Uh, uh, what kind of supply do they have to have? Who has to have uh, uh, repairs done? And uh, planning of operations and all that stuff. Correct. And so they're with you, but they've got their own job. They got their own job. So you basically have nobody to go out and take care of the grass or uh, keep the vehicles going or whatever. You got a few mechanics, you got a ton of supplies because every place that they live, there's furniture, uh, beds, uh, cots, uh, sleeping bags, all of the stuff that goes along. And they're hand receipted that stuff but it all comes back on the supply officer to make sure that all that stuff is able to get out to them. Then if the orders come down that splits the brigade headquarters and they go off in different direction, all the property that you're signed for is gone. <laughs> and you go, wow. Uh, and you are the accountable person. So and then you don't see the stuff anymore. It's, where is it? So it's a, uh, very frustrating. And I was an executive officer. And I had a company commander who was less than uh, helpful, let's put it that way. He basically put all the day-to-day -day work on my shoulders and he just uh, sat um, behind the desk and said, nope, it's all yours. I just command here. And that, that was really difficult because there was no leadership there was no uh, help. It was uh, terribly frustrating, especially for a young officer. And I became very disenchanted with the Army. All right. Uh, uh, the sad news is, even at Coochie, you still have some security issues. Oh, yes. So even though this is a headquarters unit, it has an airfield, the fact is you're there still... There are security issues. Exactly. And... You never know if you're going to get mortared in the middle of the night. Mortar, uh, mortar is a round tube. You put shells in it, and the enemy could rush into an area, handhold their mortar, which is crazy to me, drop a mortar in and put a mortar round in the middle of your complex. Uh, very seldom did they hit anything, but you still had those worries that that was going to happen at night or that they could tunnel underneath you and come up through a hole and then be a sniper or whatever. So uh, there were those worries as well. And All right, so you struggle through some of this, uh, uh, but eventually you do uh, get notice of, uh, you're getting towards the year end of your tour of duty. Correct, and, uh, and in fact, uh, it even got shortened. What, what's going on? Well. Um, I uh, had a wife at home and she was having some major difficulties. She, she just lost her dad in December and I was coming to the end of my tour. So in those days, when you came to the end of your tour and something was going on at home, the Army could give you a drop. So instead of doing a full 12 months, I came home with 11 months in country um, because I got a 30 day drop. And uh, then you go to the airport and you fly home on a commercial flight. And I'll never forget that as long as I live because that night I uh, actually linked up with a friend who I'd known from the States and we were on the same plane home together. And we got on the plane at night and uh, uh, when that plane goes down a runway it has its uh, lights on so it can see the runway but when it rotates to pull off all the lights are shut off because they don't want to be seen by enemy uh, soldiers. So looking down off to the right, I saw a firefight going on as we started to pull out. And I 
tapped Captain Rice and I said, wow, somebody's getting into it right down there. And then we pulled off and uh, off we went to Osaka, Japan, and then Anchorage, Alaska, and then down to Travis Air Force Base. So it took us about 18 to 24 hours to get home. Okay, Travis is in California. Travis is in California. Anchorage is in Alaska. Okay. So here we come out of Vietnam, 80, 90, 100 degree temperature, 80% humidity, and we land in Anchorage, Alaska that's 35 below zero. And all we have on is our jungle fatigues and really no underwear to speak of. And we have to go from the plane into the terminal and there is no sliding tarm, um, no sliding, uh, ru uh, you know what I'm talking about, that comes out to the plane. You have to go downstairs, which were icy, and inside. Talk about cold. Holy cow. I remember that like it was yesterday. But um, well, speaking about breath, things happen at Travis. Oh, yeah, that was not a happy moment in my life. Um, we got to Travis Air Force Base, and uh, we were changing clothes and going to put on what we call TWs. They're a really comfortable, short sleeve uniform, wear a hat cap on the top of our head and, and uh, Sergeant E8 or E9 came in and said, gentlemen, if you're traveling through San Francisco International Airport, you are not to wear your uniform. You must take your uniform off because we're having people attacked and spit on. And uh, immediately I felt ashamed that I could not wear my uniform. I'd fought for a year, been wounded in combat, and I couldn't wear my uniform. I had to take it off. It was like, I, I, I can't even begin to tell you the disgust that I felt at that very moment. And, it, and uh, we, were, we just felt like uh, we were unwanted and we were ashamed. And that manifested itself over the next few years. Um, I never want young soldiers sailors, Marines, to f ever feel like that when they come home. They should be proud of the uniform they wore. They should wear it um, with pride. And uh, as a matter of fact, just last night, I was at the airport. Uh, I'm on a board called Puget Sound Honor Flight, and we send World War II vets back to the Washington, D.C. monument at no cost to the vet. And they came home, and we saluted them, and there were cheers, and and tears, and um, there wasn't that for us from Vietnam. In fact, when I got home to Seattle, I uh, put my uniform on, and I was spit on by two people. I'll never forget that um, as long as I live. It wasn't, wasn't pleasant at all. Okay, so let's uh, get you finishing out your career. You come back briefly to Seattle, and then where do you report to? Uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Uh, I took over a uh, recoilless rifle range, 90 millimeter recoilless rifle, 106 millimeter recoilless rifle, and a brand new weapon called the TOW, tactically operated wire guided missile that would take out tanks. And I trained soldiers uh, on how to use those weapons. Then later, a few months later, I was given a <laughs> wonderful, uh, I'm still a first lieutenant, and I was given the wonderful uh, privilege of having the hand grenade range where we taught brand new recruits how to throw hand grenades. A um, little scary sometimes. So, so uh, you understand what it means to deal with people who really don't know don't what they're know. doing. Don't know, and I can tell you when you put that grenade in their hands and you're, you're holding them and they're gonna pull out the pen, you put your hand on top of them and you look into their eyes you can tell, because this is the first time they've ever thrown a hand grenade, that this is scary for them. So you relax them, and you say, this isn't going to hurt, and here's what we're going to do, and you just take them right through, one, two, three, by the numbers, and they throw it. And they're elated that they got to throw a hand grenade for the first time. Um, did have a couple of them drop it. Had to uh, save their lives by pushing them over a bunker so that the grenade went off and didn't hurt anybody, but um, those, those are days gone by, I guess. Well, that's the danger of preparing for that's combat is preparing. you got to deal with live ammo. All right, uh, you do get out, though, and then what happens? Um, 
I uh, came home to Seattle and actually stayed in uh, South Carolina for a little while and came home to Seattle and uh, came home to a terrible thing. Uh, there was 12% uh, unemployment in Seattle. Um, what they told me at the unemployment office, it was for veterans, brand new Vietnam veterans. It was about a 30% unemployment, between 25 and 30%. I couldn't find a job. Couldn't find a job. And uh, finally found a job. I had to move to Tacoma to get it. Um, um, and then stayed out for a little while. And in 1973, I went back into the Army Reserve and Army National Guard and then was recalled to active duty in 77 and stayed until I retired in 1993. Now, you did actually make an attempt to go back to school, is that correct? I did. And uh, uh, was that the GI Bill? I tried to use the GI Bill. And uh, I, uh, there was a lot of confusion in my life after I came home because I still had a lot of misgivings about how I felt. I knew... <laughs> We, we couldn't talk about the war. Uh, the hard thing for me was I watched the war on NBC Nightly News every night. And, uh, um, and they talked about body count and they talked about the number of casualties that day. And it just, just inside, it just, there was turmoil. It just ground into me that, uh, number one, that I, I came home and there were still people there. And number two, that um, you hated to get that notice that somebody that you knew uh, died. And I, I didn't handle it very well. I, I used alcohol uh, to numb that feeling and it actually got me into some trouble, which I was eventually able to say, I can't go this route. And I got some help and turned my life around and uh, went back on active duty and uh, ended up a career where I was proud of the Army again and proud of what it was done and what do we have now? We've got troops at war that are coming home and we're taking care of them and honoring all those veterans who served. And to me right now, the most important thing in the world is that this country embraces those veterans. Because you know what, big picture, if it wasn't for those veterans, we wouldn't be where we are today. We wouldn't be in the freedom of you and I being able to talk. It wasn't the politicians. Politicians didn't do it. It was the veterans who served and paid with that uh, price of their life to bring us to where we are now. So you show me a veteran, I'm going to make sure that they're, they're uh, in good shape and they're, they're going strong and I do everything I can. I'm on the King County Veterans Advisory Board. Uh, but I'm on the board for Puget Sound Honor Flight, which we just talked about. And uh, I'm a commander of our local VFW post. So you show me veterans and I'll do everything I can to make sure that they're okay because they're the ones who made this country what it is. Um, country's not perfect. Country's got problems, but you know what? We work on it every day. We work on it every day. So, All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing with us. Uh, again, this is Conversations about the Vietnam War. And my guest has been Dave Wagner. And thank you so much for thank joining us. Thank you for today. having me. You bet.